Steve-O is absolutely a legend. Being on Jackass for over a decade and all the stunts that he's pulled, as a doctor, I'm not even sure how he's still alive. But in this podcast, we have some really interesting conversations about his health, the injuries he's sustained, some unique projects he has coming up, including him getting double D breast implants. As an individual who spent so much time in hospitals getting treated for injuries, I thought he would be the perfect guest. Let's get started. I don't know how much you know about me, but I'm a family medicine doctor by training. I, I understand that you are a legit doctor, <laughs> yes. a massive YouTuber, <laughs> a uh, sexiest doctor award winner. Um, yeah, it was a no-brainer for me to do this, so th thank you for the invite. Yeah, no, thank you for coming on. Uh, obviously, yeah. uh, a legend. I've been a huge fan growing up. I came as an immigrant from Russia, so American culture was very new to me. But wow. Jackass was almost the beginning of that for me. So uh, it's so, so is, cool. Is English not your first language? Correct. Yeah. Russian is my first language. It's pretty incredible, man. Like, what is it that um, allows some people to take on a second language and speak just undetectably mm -hmm. uh, well? You know, you would never know that English is not your first language. I think it's age. People have different cutoffs, but they say if you come before age 10, you generally don't get the accent. I say it's probably a little bit younger than that, eight, seven, eight. If you come before then, no accent undetectable. For example, my sister, she's nine years older than me. She has a heavy accent. Okay. Yeah. Like you can hear definitely she's from Soviet Russia. Wow. <laughs> Are you uh, a sparkling water fan or flat water? I do. Fan? I like it. Yeah. I don't know where I got that from, but now I'm obsessed with sparkling water. I think it's because my parents poisoned me with soda when I was a kid. Right. And then I'm like... I can't keep drinking soda. It's just not healthy. Now, as a doctor, mm -hmm. uh, do you have an opinion about the health of sparkling water versus not? I have a few tips when it comes to sparkling water. One is if you have issues with acid reflux, not a great idea to drink before bed. Okay. Because it bubbles, makes you burp. Some of the acid can leak out obviously very uncomfortable. I absolutely have issues with acid really? reflux and um, a long running case of Barrett's esophagus. Wow, okay. So that's like a precancerous state in your Correct. esophagus. And I've, I've monitored it very closely with my uh, gastroenterologist. Yes. Um, regular endoscopies on a yearly basis. Mm. But my last endoscopy, um, the doctor said that uh, I've stabilized and do not need another endoscopy for three years. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad to hear it because I, I heard you talking about that on Hot Ones and then you started pounding hot sauce right. and I got nervous for you. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, well, that's interesting. Yeah. So Barrett's esophagus usually occurs with individuals who have long standing uncontrolled acid reflux. So have you had issues with heartburn and pain? Um, yeah. I, I I did, and um, I mean, just the all of the alcohol, mm. you know, I, I just remember, I remember times when I was still drinking when my acid reflux was, my heartburn was so terribly bad that it would wake me up in the middle of the night. I would go to the bathroom and just barf to just mm. try to get Ease the- Ease the pain. Yeah. Wow. And was there any ever blood? Not that I recall. Mm. The reason I ask is in individuals who do drink a lot of alcohol and have issues with their esophagus, sometimes you get tears. And um, you can have a tear in the esophagus or something known as esophageal varices, where you get swelling in the blood vessels of the esophagus and they can rupture inside and you could have bleeding inside. So I'm glad that never happened to right. you. But yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it, it's you're basically a professional patient at this point. I'm a professional doctor, you're a professional patient. Um, Not because of that, but because of all right. your lifelong <laughs> injuries. Yeah, I've uh, said many times that uh, if if all of my hospital visits were to the same hospital, I would be on that hospital's Christmas card list. <laughs> you would have a wing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've definitely been to the hospital a lot. You haven't? No, no, I have. Oh, yeah. yeah I've well, definitely been a lot. What do you, is the, like, what's, I, I read in your book that you were saying the worst stunt you ever performed was the jet fuel. That was the most painful. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It, um, it was, it was a frustrating question for, uh, 
you know, for me, when people would ask, what was the most painful stunt? Particularly because it was such a frequently asked question. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it frustrated me because there are really different criteria to the pain. There's the duration yeah. and then there's the intensity. And, and the type. Right. And um, I uh, would lean towards um, the, you know, quicker it's over the better. But, you know, it's just, it's just apples and oranges. Sure. And then when I had suffered the third degree burns on 15% of my body and needed skin graft surgery, that actually checked both boxes. The burning, the length. Yeah. Yeah, the duration and the intensity of the pain was uh, like just in another world. I, I went on effectively a tour of burn units after that. Wow. And... Uh, and, and heard multiple times that people who have been both shot and stabbed as well as suffered burns will tell you burns are the worst pain of everything. I could see that. Yeah. That's really bad. Did you feel the pain right away when the burn happened or was this? I, I did. I did. It, uh, it wasn't as bad the next day. And then each day thereafter, it just got like more and more unbearable. Mm -hmm. And then at day five, I was like, okay, like I gotta. So it's I progressive. Up showed up in the hospital on day five and they're like, what the fuck were you waiting for? Oh, you, you know? didn't go right away? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought that it would just get better, you know? Okay. And uh, and then I showed up on day five and they, they uh, explained that I needed emergency surgery. Wow. And the real pisser was that uh, their next question was, when's the last time you ate? And I was like, I just eight you know, before I came So they're here. like, you have to wait eight hours. Eight hours. And I had just um, refused um, the, you know, painkiller, you know, be like, no, I'm a sober guy. I don't want any painkiller. Mm -hmm. And then I heard, we cannot operate on you for eight hours because you just ate. And I said, okay, give me the painkiller. <laughs> Do you know what they gave you? I believe it was Dilaudid. Dilaudid, yeah. And um, my arms were so burnt, they put the IV in my neck. Wow. Yeah. So you had like a central line put in. Yeah. And um, it uh, it's, it's crazy being a, a sober guy in recovery. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, how quickly that awakens the beast. You know, like, oh, like, are you in pain? Yes. <laughs> the <laughs> receptors yeah. right away started. Yeah, it's really crazy. And, 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 and it was, uh, I, it, it had a real like sort of powerful effect on me. Like I... I you know, yes, I am still in pain. I need more. And then what snapped me out of it at one point when I was asking for yet more, they said, we'll give you more, but it's getting to a point where I'd be concerned about your, you know, getting off. Yeah. And that woke me up and I was like, oh yeah, like I got it. I can't what would your it. advice be either to yourself in that moment when they initially offered it or maybe to someone else who's facing the same dilemma? Um, I mean, there. I could be in that uh, situation a thousand times, and and one hundred percent of the time, I would take, take that painkiller because yeah. the pain was that bad. Wow. Um, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm kind of careful about giving out advice to other people, particularly as it relates to addiction. Sure. But um, I know that for me, in in my fourteen years of sobriety, I've never even filled out a prescription for uh, for any kind of a, a painkiller. It's been all Advil and Tylenol. Okay, congratulations been, on that, that's a long yeah, time. Yeah, I've, I've been in um, in horrific pain and uh, taken Advil and Tylenol together, <laughs> okay. but that's as far as I've gone. Got it, okay. And in, in severe cases, we do recommend that uh, in the hospital. So. It, it's unbelievable how effective both of those uh, are, uh, Tylenol and Advil. Well, because they work slightly in different ways, so you kind of get a stacking right. effect of the medicine. And again, I don't recommend that to most patients because it's largely unnecessary for most pain. Right. But in certain instances, a big example of it is actually dental pain. And I've heard you've had right. oh a lot God. of dental Unbelievable issues. Unbelievable amounts. Yeah. Yeah. And, and your biggest risk that you say people face is by doing one thing that not everyone likes to do. What is Floss, that thing? Yeah. Floss, yeah. It's, it's not a risk that, uh, that everybody faces. It's just personally my biggest regret mm. in life. Like, uh, you know, in the grand scheme of things, my biggest regret is that I was not diligent about flossing. 
Right. And um, I, uh, I think I was genetically predisposed to having poor oral health, mm. you know, in the teeth and gums department. But um, part of that, and, and really the, the worst part of that, is that um, I was one of those people who, I am one of those people who cannot get away with not flossing. Mm. Because not flossing led to uh, the presence of a bacteria mm -hmm. with a very, it's a very distinctive odor when mm -hmm. someone has this bacteria. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the crazy thing about it is that the person who has that bacteria in their doesn't mouth smell doesn't it. know it. Yeah. Doesn't know it. And I remember like, um, you know, being uh, like in my very early 20s, maybe late teens, my mom would say, oh, your, your breath. I'm like, mom, I just brushed my teeth. And she's like, I don't care. Your breath is. And I didn't get it. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. And um, it, was, it was just years and years later that uh, that a dentist said, hey, you know, um, you've got this odor in your mouth. Like, uh, you, you know, and, and uh, I became a diligent flosser. One time I got in a van with all the jackass guys and, and we man, and we man says, Oh dude, Steve-O your breath. And Knoxville just says, saying Steve-O has bad breath is like saying we man is short. <laughs> it's just all the time. And, and, I uh, got, got so many years of my life that, uh, it was disgusting for people to have a conversation with me because of this odor coming out of my and mouth. And did flossing solve that? It did. I had, I had, uh, a round of deep cleaning, okay, and um, and and flossed ever since. Now I have a whole ritual at night. Um, water pick is how mm -hmm. I start. Yep. Then I floss. Then I brush. Then I tongue scrape. Okay. Then I rinse with the uh, fluoride rinse. Okay, I love it. So you have like the full cycle going on. Yeah, because I'm just such horrific gum recession mm. that really it's just an exercise and doing everything I can to preserve what little remains. Yeah. And, and if it weren't for my poor oral hygiene with the flaws, because it's not just the, you know, the, the bacteria, the odor sure. that was emanating from my mouth. It like, I, I blame the, the hardcore gum recession on that too. Yeah, of course. And I'm curious, did you, when you started doing the hardcore dental care, did you at the same time get the Barrett's esophagus process started? I had the, um, I, I had it already. But you had it already. Yeah, the reason yeah. I ask is because a lot of times acid reflux will present with bad breath. Wow. So I wonder if like as or a child. Dipping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Were you like a kid uh, having early symptoms and that's how you developed Barrett's esophagus from long standing reflux? I wonder, uh, it, it sounds like it could have been, uh, it could be a chicken or the egg thing here yeah. because the, the, um, acid reflux presenting as bad breath. So like what came first, the, yeah, the exactly. parents or the bad breath? Yeah, yeah, for sure. But yeah. It's, it's crazy. And you know what, what's, what's so, uh, perplexing is how it's, um, like in our culture, like, like you'll tell somebody if, uh, if they've got like a booger in their nose, yeah. you know, like if someone's got like some, oh, you've got some food on your face. Yeah. But like nobody and myself included can uh, bear to say to somebody, <laughs> dude, you're, dude, you know. Well, because I think it's not as easily to be fixed. Like you can wipe this off, but right. if someone's breath's like, <laughs> Right. And, and, really and, and I want to, like when I smell that very distinctive bacteria smell coming out of someone's mouth, I, I I have this inner dialogue. I want to tell the person like, hey, like, you know, I'm I I don't want to be unkind, but I you know I I want you to know that that uh, I I can smell this thing that that I used to have a problem with, and the answer is to to go to the dentist and get a cleaning and then floss, and and a real tell is that if you floss and smell the floss, you can tell them. Well, yeah, that that's that's that that's, actually happens to people that are healthy as well if they haven't flossed in a little while. Right, yeah. and and, and uh, now as I move forward in my life, I, I, I really predict that I'm gonna have a whole new biggest regret and that is gonna be um, 
not having a very uh, disciplined stretching regimen. Interesting. But you are meditating still, right? Oh, I'm are, meditating my ass off. Are you on your uh, streak still? Yeah, yeah What's over a thousand today? days. A thousand days. I think I'm like a thousand and six days. All right, so over three years now. You have it on not the Not over three years. Three years is, is going to be December oh. 27th. See, this is doctors aren't good at math. But, yeah. You know. Yeah, I'm, I'm on day 1006. Wow. Yeah. It, and you log it religiously daily. like Yeah, for more. sure. It, it's almost like the act of meditating, I could take it or leave it. It's getting credit from my app I do it for. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No, it's like a challenge that you've met each day. Yeah, because I, I'm such a, an all or nothing, like no moderation guy. Like without like the, the app to keep the, the, the streak live, like I would just fall off. Like Interesting. Where do you think that comes from? I don't know. Like you, you love- getting big viewership numbers. No, I love that. You yeah. love Any kind document. of attention, any kind of credit, any kind of like- uh, Well, first of all, you deserve it. Well, You've had you. a very unique life, like listening to some of the podcasts you've been on before, your book. Uh, I mean, Ringling Brothers Clown School, that right. sounded like a trip. Um, anyway, it would have been a really uh, crazy and compelling reality TV show. The, the the whole process Builder. of Clown College. I mean, uh, it was 1997 when I went to Clown College. <clears throat> so there really was no such thing as reality TV yet. But uh, it was basically an elimination show, you know, like- um, <laughs> Survivor sort of, of clown school. Yeah, 33 clowns were accepted after untold thousands um, auditioned. And then of the 33 clowns, all 33 graduated, but only 10 were awarded with contracts with the circus. So it was like wow. kind of, you know, an elimination dynamic. There was a lot of backstabbing. Like, really? So there was drama amongst- Yeah, I mean, you might like, it would not be shocking if uh, somebody got their alarm clock unplugged so that they Ooh. would be like late and, and then have that be frowned upon. And you know, I never thought I'd say this, but there's a lot of similarities to clown school and medical school <laughs> because there's it. people that like try and stab you in the back in medical school. They're called gunners. They actually have a okay, name for wow. that. Did you guys have a name for? We did not. Oh. We did not. But, but, but nobody was <laughs> upset if a clown, uh, you know, had some unfavorable situation they found <laughs> themselves in. Fair. Yeah. Um, if you think you were coming up at a time like this, like early in your career. And question. there's TikToks. It's a great question. Are you crushing it on TikTok right now? Had I been born 20 years later, would I have found success in this new digital landscape? It's a, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, because when I came up, uh, there wasn't even the internet, you know, I mean, there was like, literally they did not have the internet. And, um, you know, I recorded my stunts on, onto, uh, video cassette tapes known as VHS tapes. And, uh, I would edit my footage by, uh, by wiring two VCRs together. <laughs> You know, how many of the people listening even know what a VCR is? No, come on, they know. It's they a know. video cassette recorder. <laughs> and then I would physically walk my, my video cassette to the post office and mail it to whoever I thought might watch it. And, and that being the, the case, there was considerably less uh, content to compete with. You know, mm -hmm. there was a lot less noise to rise above. And um, you know, to answer the question, um, I, don't, I don't know how I would have done with all of the noise to compete with and try to rise above, but I genuinely believe that I am such a persistent son of a bitch, such a rabid attention whore that I just would have been every bit as tireless and, and, you know, I just like, yeah. I'm a tireless attention whore to the point where I think I would have risen above the noise no matter when I was born. Okay. I think you would have definitely gotten shadow banned <laughs> by these <laughs> sites. Right. Yeah, that's still a concern. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah. The community guidelines violation check. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, because even I did a reaction video uh, to the new Jackass movie talking about the medical situations that right. could, could arise in each one of them. And it got uh, like age gated. It got blocked. Yeah, I, don't, I don't doubt that. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if it was a copyright claim too from, from a Viacom. Yeah, honestly. But I, then again, I, like by doing that, you, it's clearly, clearly a fair usage too. Yeah, exactly. If you're adding commentary to it. That's cool that you're aware of that because a lot of people are like, no, no, no don't ever use my stuff. Right, fair, right, right, right. fair use is not a thing. Fair, fair use is and, and, and what you're doing by... Uh, analyzing it and giving your own commentary, you're changing the meaning of it. Yeah. And that's precisely what fair usage is for. Exactly. And I, I, my thought is, I think you would crush it on these platforms if you were born 20 years later. Not that you're not, you're doing right. amazing now, but I worry that with the state you were in at the time when you were younger, right. with alcohol, with drugs, sure. would you have gone too far for the views? Um, Maybe that's just me speculating, but I'm curious what you think about that. I don't know that uh, there was any like limitations, and you then, know, like I mean, there were like because uh, the world's had, always I, on now. Like I mean, the 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 camera was always that uh, you know mystical uh, super. You know, like I worshipped the video camera is what I'm trying to mm. say. And and um, I don't know that I could have worshipped the camera or the footage or the audience like any uh, more than I already did. So mm. going too far for the views, I think that was that was going on very yeah. much. Uh, I just had, I really looked to the video camera as like a, uh, like a, a religious kind of a thing, you know, um, the, the, the human condition is such a, a terrible catch 22, such an awful prank on us. You know, we, yeah. we've got one instinct to, which is to survive. We've got one guarantee we won't survive. So it's like, how do you handle that? Mortality is such a motherfucker. And, um, some people turn to religion to try to wrap their head around their mortality because mm -hmm. heaven's going to be great and everything will be okay. Uh, you know, another thing is, is really popular is you know, reproducing because there's something about that that, that, that uh, defeats your mortality. You're going to have your, your uh, legacy and your children. And then there's, for me, the video camera, like leaving footage behind. It was my message in a bottle. Well, it's your art. Right. Right, like cavemen were scrawling stick figures on caves, like presumably because they knew that that wall art would outlive them. Yeah, and uh, leaving something behind of, of permanence, you know, to be a legacy. That's how, and I took it so seriously. So, um, so yeah, as far as like going too far for views, like there's no lengths that I wouldn't be willing to go to for that VHS video camera because I viewed that footage as just totally permanent. That was my way to live forever. Where do you, what do you credit like your high level of insight to? Cause you're very insightful as an individual. Oh, well, well thank you. Um, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I I'd certainly had a really good education. Mm. In Miami? Um, oh. I lived in Miami among many other places. I was, uh, I, I was raised in, uh, five different countries. Yeah. <laughs> so um I, I try I, I try You were high school in England, college I, Miami, right? Yeah, I, high school in England and college uh you know what what little I I made it through. I was in I was in Miami. So when you say you had a good education, which one of those are you referencing? Uh, I would say that <clears throat> that the uh the grade school and you know um the the high school that I went to it was in England. It was called the American School in London, and uh, you know I was classmates with like the the American ambassador to England's son. Like all of these, like you know, just it, it was an uber privileged school mm. for uh, like uber privileged people. And um, of my senior uh, class. 80% of uh, my senior class went on to Ivy League schools. And I was like effectively a loser for going to the University of Miami, which is actually like a pretty good school. Exactly. 
And you know, what's, what's particularly interesting in this context, speaking with you, is that uh, my best friend, like I, said, I, I moved to and from London, England multiple mm -hmm. times. Yep. Um, this school that I, that I went to high school at, I also um, attended um, fourth grade there, fifth grade and sixth grade. And then I left and then I ended up coming back. So the one guy who I've known the longest out of anybody in the world is my buddy Abdullah, who I, who I met when, I, when we were nine years old in fourth grade. We also graduated um, high school together. And Abdullah, like 80% of the class, went to uh, <clears throat> Brown University. He graduated from Brown University with a 4.0, went on to Cornell Medical School, um, and then went on to become a pediatric surgeon at the Mayo Clinic wow. and literally invented um, methods of operating on unborn children still in the womb. Wow. Like just like came up with them and they, and like introduced them into the world. And now it's like you can operate on children before they're born because of my buddy Abdullah. Wow. And, and we could not have taken <laughs> more different paths. Yes. We just couldn't. And uh, yet we've stayed stayed in touch all these years. Really? Okay. Yeah. We, what like, has he made? Like I'm curious what a doctor who's your friend feelings are on what your journey has been like. He... Uh, He's all about it. I mean, he's super supportive of uh, of, of me and, and what I do. <clears throat> I remember uh, I remember him being really uh, emphatic, you know, above anybody else. Like when you're like, if you, you know, wear a condom. <laughs> like really, like he's like, you don't want to know, you know, you don't want to know. Wear a condom, like he. Uh, okay. Like really emphatically, you're jumping off a building, <laughs> like, right? Uh, I mean, he 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 was uh, you know seemed to be privy to some information that uh, made him feel very strongly about that. Okay, um, and uh, yeah, it's it, interesting too that um, you know when he was my best friend when when I was in fourth grade, like in high school, you know, like we were really close, and. Um, my dad was a super successful businessman, and um, as such, like uh, as I grew up, the house my family lived in grew larger and larger, and and I was just for some reason very self conscious of that, you know, like I I I, uh, I I don't know why, but but I was like, you hated the wealth like that. I, I was I was embarrassed of it, you okay. know, like I I don't know why, but. Um, but I was embarrassed of it, like to the point where um, in high school, I um, went, my intention was to ride my skateboard to school. But that took some time. And if I overslept or was running late for any reason, then I was out of time to ride my skateboard to school. My dad would be leaving about the same time. So I would be forced to catch a ride with my dad who was chauffeur driven and just sitting in the back seat reading a newspaper. And uh, when that was the case, I would ride in the front passenger seat. And then when I got dropped off at school, I would hug the driver <laughs> <laughs> because I was like embarrassed but of being a was it everyone kid. else wealthy in this wealthy yeah, school? I mean, and, and, and that's a very good point too, but I was just embarrassed of being a rich kid. I, 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 I hated that. Mm -hmm. And I, um, hated the idea of uh, of bringing like schoolmates over to my house because it was like a big ass house, you know? Oh. And I was, I was self-conscious about that. So um, I, I didn't bring a lot of people over to my house. I was just always at Abdullah's house, you know? And, and in fourth grade, I remember like, Abdullah's family was super religious, you know, Muslim family from Sudan. And I would join Abdullah in in praying to Mecca and stuff. Oh, like wow. I was just like, all right, this is what we're doing. It's cool, you know. Abdullah, very um, highly evolved, like super spiritual guy. And um, when he was at the Mayo Clinic, my comedy tour brought me to uh, Minneapolis, where the Mayo Clinic is. 
And um, Abdullah and I went out to, to uh, go get lunch. We were at like a, a bar playing pool because we used to play pool when we were kids. Over this game of pool, I was expressing to Abdullah that I um, do not want to have children. And he was not understanding this. I said, I said you know, like my rationale is uh, on top of uh, the, my genetic predisposition to addiction, mm. you know, and just sort of like the, all of that comes with that. I look at the world and I see the, the increasing disparity of wealth, you know, that the age gap has just really stopped being funny a long time ago. Like the, I, I said to Abdullah, you know, when, when our parents graduated from a university, that meant placing in a career of your choosing. And then for us, like our generation, not quite so much. Like it was viewed as it was very helpful to have a university diploma, but it didn't guarantee you anything. And then now for, for our kids, I mean, it's just being bogged down in, in crazy amounts of debt. You know, mm. like the, the, the opportunity in this world has dwindled and dwindled. And I just cannot bring myself to create a human being to fight against this struggle. Wow, okay, you know, that's, like, that's dark. I take, I, I mean, yeah, I think I, I take it seriously. I really respect the idea of it. And it is dark. Um, Abdullah's response to all of this, I'll never forget it. It was, <laughs> it was so intense. He says, in Africa, with all of the poverty, the famine, the disease, do you think people are any less happy? My gut reaction, right? We're like, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do. But intellectually, I get what Abdullah was saying, which is that you can strip from somebody their, you know, everything really, their health, their, you know, food. Like, like you can take everything away, but. One thing that you cannot take away from somebody is their capacity to love another. Mm. And it is from the capacity to love another, from the act of loving another, that happiness truly is derived. So to, to Abdullah's point, people are not less happy. If anything, they're arguably maybe happier mm -hmm. in, in Africa. Yeah. But I still got the vasectomy. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, not that day. Not that day. Oh, okay. You didn't not, go from pool and like, this conversation. Not that day, but uh, but I went through with the vasectomy Olympics. Do you think you consider yourself more of a pessimist than an optimist then? Um, probably. Really? Yeah. I take you as such an optimist. Um, You're like high on life right now. I mean, You're logging meditation hours. I, 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 absolutely. But... Um, in, in my new book, mm -hmm. you know, and, and this isn't just for the sake of uh, shamelessly promoting it, but, but this is something that I think is pertinent here. In the final, ch the final chapter of the book begins with the question, in quotes, are you happy? Mm -hmm. And then I, I go on to say that question just has always made me super uncomfortable. It makes me just, I, I like, I, I find, cause it's one thing to say, you know, like, hey, yeah, dude, how's it going? You know, that's super casual. And, yeah. But are you happy is a much, much more uh, serious question. And, and, and my, my natural instinct, my, my gut reaction to that is like, if I think about it, no, I'm not. You know, like I, 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 I consider myself uh, largely gripped by anxiety, fear, and stress. Mm. And I, I, uh, I believe that my natural default uh, feeling position is, is just that, that everything's not okay, or if it's okay now, it's not going to be okay, and that, like, I've got to hurry up and do something to make it so that everything will be okay. I've got to hustle, I got to hurry, I got to work, I got to accomplish. And, um, and that's just my perpetual state. Um, and the question bothered me because I feel genuinely that that's my perpetual state. 
And as I just kind of chewed on it and, and processed it, I arrived at, no, I'm not happy. And that's okay because I don't want to be happy. I, I, I believe that it, it follows that to be happy is to be content. To be content is to not need anything. And to not need anything is to be fucking lazy and, and potentially a Interesting. loser. Interesting that you read into it that way. Yeah, I mean, that I, now I wish that I could work, 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 and then have a switch that I can flip where now I'm not working and now I'm perfectly comfortable and happy, but I don't have that switch. Sure. It's funny that you use the word content because have you ever seen a show, it's canceled now, I thought it was really good, called Magic City on Stars about how the casinos were potentially gonna leave Cuba and come to Florida in like- I've not seen that, but isn't the it crazy when you said it, it's canceled now, how powerful the word canceled has become? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I got to be careful. This <laughs> Podcast like, What over. did the show do? <laughs> no, the show the show's a great show. Uh, funding, I think it was an issue. Okay. But uh, there was a scene where one of the mafia guys gets asked, uh, are you happy? And he goes, howdy doody's happy. I'm contented. Wow. Okay. And I'm like, okay. Kind of a similar message. I mean, I, I would I would submit that happy and content are synonymous. I bet if you yeah. looked up in a thesaurus, you would. Yeah. The way that I look at it um, as a doctor is based on research. And what we've seen is pessimistic people in comparison to optimistic people are usually more accurate in predicting the future. I bet. Because they are more realistic <clears throat> versus optimistic. Sure. But this is gonna probably relate very well to you, their health status is usually worse. Okay. Uh, because <clears throat> of the immense worry and anxiety that right. comes along with being yeah. a pessimist. Wor yeah, worry, anxiety, it's not good for you. Yeah. And uh, Chronically, <laughs> right. like long-term, it's not good for you. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a pisser. It, it's a pisser and, and um, I wish that on some level I, I could change. I mean, I do take Zoloft. Okay. Um, I... Uh, but that's like a, like more than anxiety. That's um, I think that I shouldn't say I think I know for a fact that if I'm not taking Zoloft, I go into dark places very easy. Mm -hmm. it, it it takes only a minor disturbance for me to go straight into suicidal ideation, mm, and it's it. super scary. I don't think that I've ever <clears throat> been particularly suicidal. I think that the, the the travesty of all that is just the the constructive the the time that's wasted on just fantasizing and just being in this dark morbid place. And when I'm taking Zoloft, I, I don't ever go. You know, I, I, I I'm taking Zoloft. I do not think about killing myself, and that's a bonus. That's powerful. Well, yeah. Not the bonus. That's intended. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah, not a, it's intended. But and I don't want to come off like a Zoloft commercial, and I'm sure everybody's different, and you know, no, but, but it's Zoloft super is an for SSRI. Me. It's a type of medication that we prescribe for anxiety or depression. And uh, what's interesting about those medications and how I speak to them uh, with my patients before I prescribe them is a lot of patients have a fear that it's going to make them not feel things like make them go blank. And the goal of it is just to tone down the intensity of those negative or very right. positive emotions. Cause anxiety is considered a positive emotion. It brings your energy level up. Like there's a lot Ooh, of okay. energy there with um, depression. You're down usually. And as a result, you have low energy. So with a medicine like an SSRI, the idea is to take off the highs and lows to give you better control in those moments. And that's essentially right. what you're saying yeah. when you're saying it helps you have um, less chance of having suicidal ideation. Yeah. Yeah, I, I swear by it. I, I, I really, <clears throat> I, I feel that Zoloft is very important to me. And, um, you know, other than that, the, uh, you know, like the, the kind of perpetual, like, scrunching of my, that, that I just feel like I hold all this tension and, and anxiety. And, and I kind of just consider that to be the fire under my ass, you know, to, uh, to strive to, to accomplish things. Well, so many times <clears throat> the things that make us really special and do great things are oftentimes our weaknesses at the same time. Sure. It, it's, it's hard to imagine <clears throat> that, uh, 
that, that there's any such thing as other than that. <laughs> yeah, like I have patients come in and say, well, I don't want to be less angry. That helps me keep my edge at work. <laughs> and I'm like, well, can we find a way where right. it's not going to get you arrested <laughs> and then right. you can keep working well? Yeah. And it's that fine line of always balance and coming back to that center point, which have you done any reading on Buddhism? I'm, I'm curious. Absolutely. Okay. What are your thoughts There's on that? There's a bunch of, about Buddhism in this book okay. <clears throat> about how uh, <clears throat> the... Uh, the philosophy of Buddhism, and Buddhism, <clears throat> Buddhism is much less of a religion than it is a philosophy. Yep. And that uh, all of human suffering is um, caused by craving, where it, it, it follows that um, if you're in pain, then it's natural to crave for that pain to end or... Uh, be lessened. And by the same measure, whatever situation we find ourselves in, if we're in some situation that's that's pleasurable, we will crave for that pleasure to last longer or to intensify. So like the 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 thrust of Buddhism as I understand it is that no matter what our circumstances in is as as humans, we will crave for those circumstances to improve. That's just the nature of our of our ego. That's the nature of us as an organism. And because that's the case, there is no state that we can be in where we're actually going to be satisfied. We're always just going to want more, 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 more. And, and, and it's that craving of more and better and just to improve our circumstance that, that causes suffering. And so Buddhism, uh, it, it, it points to um, accepting the state you're in as opposed to craving for it to improve. And that's easier said than done. Yeah. How do you meditate? Is that sort of uh, what you try and achieve? Mantra-based. Okay. So it's the same as the transcendental meditation, the Vedic meditation, they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. Except hilariously, the transcendental meditation people and the Vedic meditation people are, are at like a low grade war with each other. Really, but why? They're, do, they're doing exactly the same thing. <laughs> okay, so they're just claiming who does it better or first? I mean, I'm not necessarily <laughs> even sure the nature of okay. the beef, but I just know that there's a low level there's meditation beef. beef. Yeah, there's a low level beef because um, I, I started out um, with transcendental meditation in 2013. And I was not, um, it's like one of the funniest things in this damn book. I was, um, I, I was not particularly, uh, like diligent about it, but I, but I would do it. And the, the place that taught me transcendental meditation, my teacher, um, asked me to, uh, you know, if I would be, be willing to, you know, participate in like a fundraising effort to bring meditation to uh, inner city schools to try to disrupt the school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. And I was all in. I posted this all over my social media, I raised all the money I possibly could. And that place, it's called the David Lynch Foundation, they, uh, they taught me to meditate. They, they didn't follow me back on Twitter. They didn't even thank oh. me for the money I donated. And I was so incensed by that. Oh. I, despite them, I quit meditating. I was like, fuck oh, that, I swear, dude. Which is so funny because the idea is it's supposed to be like a spiritual practice. Yeah. And I'm just like, fuck them, I quit. And so, uh, you know, the, 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 the following years, I really did feel that uh, I was doing a disservice to myself by not meditating, but I still held that grudge. So I, I uh, ended up finding a new meditation teacher who just happened to be like of the Vedic, <laughs> you it. know? And so that this is where like, I was like, wow, this is exactly the same thing they taught me last time, but like they're beeping with each other. And so it just helped me to nurture that grudge. I got a new mantra and I, now I do it every day. Maybe I'm being overly <laughs> philosophic with this, but you know, when they say you ask God for patience, <laughs> they give you a, a complicated problem. Sure. So maybe you wanted meditation and they gave you this to learn that you really need to find meditation. I mean, who knows? 
<clears throat> who knows, but it's really fucking hilarious that, uh, you know, that, that I managed to, uh, be so resentful at, at, uh, you know, in this spiritual practice of meditating and, um, and, and, and despite all that, now I'm just so thrilled that, that I have a disciplined practice. I know too, that when, um, when I got in, when I first started with the transcendental meditation, like you fall off once, you know, and then it's like just really easy to just fall off mm -hmm. altogether. And that's why I knew going back into it, like let me keep it on an app so that it, heaven forbid, if I break the streak, I like, you know. Well, hopefully if you break it, you still go back. I, that, but I would be very worried that I wouldn't. Oh, okay. Well, that's, <laughs> that's a fair concern. Yeah, I would be very worried that I wouldn't. Okay. And my new meditation teacher, uh, any meditation teacher isn't going to frown on the use of a timer, of an app, of a, mm -hmm. you know, of an alarm, and and um, my new meditation teacher has since come around. He he, I sent him my screenshots, my app, and he's like, he's, I get it. Okay, I get it. I'm actually his star pupil. Wow. Okay. <laughs> because of the number of days. Yeah, yeah. Because like I don't, I just don't miss. Okay. You know, that's amazing. That's like dedication. Yeah, I don't miss, and and uh, I I have an unshakable faith that. Um, my meditation practice causes the universe to conspire in my favor. It's, it's, it's an arguably outlandish belief, but I believe that the universe responds to um, effort to acknowledge, to have a relationship with it, to plug into the, the force. I don't think it's outlandish. I think it's very accurate. I did. I, you can't. You can't tell me otherwise. Yeah. You know. You can't. I think even medically, it makes sense. Yeah. Because, oh my God! Uh, Abdullah was telling me yeah. about times when uh, prayer healed fucking yeah unhealable shit. Well, that's why I'm very careful with talking about integrative therapies because people say, "Oh, well, they mislead people to believe this is the cure." Right. And I, that's not what I'm trying to say with a lot of these therapies. But if you're not giving up traditional medicine that actually works and has proven benefits and doing your prayers, please, that's amazing. Right. Because we like to shit on the placebo effect in medicine. Right. Oh, that's placebo, that's placebo. Right. Why? It fucking works. Yeah, yeah. Like if I give a hundred people a sugar pill and then these hundred people a real pill, a pain relief, and I tell all of them that it's a real pain pill, 30% of the people that got the sugar pill will feel pain relief. Mm -hmm. Why would I not take advantage of that and allow people to have it's spiritual great example. journeys? It's a fantastic example. Yeah. Now, the, is it more than 30% on the, the real pill? Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> that's how we do our trials. Because right. you can never compare just does this pill work. Right, right, right. You have to compare it to a fake pill. Right. You that's the random control for the experiment. Exactly, yeah. Um, do you reminded me of a, of a, a situation again with my buddy Abdullah. My sister, um, her second child was born with both autism and Down syndrome. Mm. And I believe that uh, it's common with, with um, children with Down syndrome, there was a hole a in, in, yep. uh, in the, the baby's heart. Yep. And uh, it was a, a, a super upsetting and terrifying situation. And I'll be, I'll be damned. If after not hearing from Abdullah for like the longest time, it, like uh, no communication whatsoever, just in, in the in the midst of that situation, Abdullah called either me or my sister out of nowhere and said, "Hey, you know your, your baby's gonna be okay," and the whole fucking closed. <laughs> like, like uh, okay. that. I mean, it was, it was like that crazy. But it wasn't like day after. It was, it was uh, I would have to call my sister and ask yeah. her. But uh, that's when I started looking at Abdullah a little different. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, all that praying we did like, early wait on. Wait a second. Yeah, praying in Mecca when we yeah. were kids. Like, uh, I was like, man, you know, Abdullah, like, anything you want to tell me, man? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, th there are spontaneous closures of a, a lot of these. Sure. Sure. Like, especially uh, on the upper part of the heart, which is between the atrium. The, right. Uh, 
But yeah, it's not unheard of that uh, that the hole closes. I think that's the the less striking piece of that uh, story. It's just that the confidence. Well, the unsolicited call from out of nowhere uh, with with uh, how do you know the, the, the I, <laughs> oh wait, you don't know? I have no fucking clue. Like, uh, and you didn't ask. I, he, I, I think I did ask, and it was just like I vague and it's <laughs> like <laughs> you're like, what happened to patient privacy? <laughs> <laughs> right, it, it, it's crazy. Wow. Now, going back to something you said earlier, um, in feeling embarrassed by having wealth, yeah. You've kind of lived your life in a way where you've experienced both ends of the spectrum. Big Incredible time. wealth. You were homeless for a period Big of time. time. And, and and I was when I dropped out of the University of Miami in nineteen ninety three, I um was homeless f- for three years. And um I mean homeless is sort of a I was more of a couch surfer. I think the difference between a, ho- a homeless person and a couch surfer is just more of a sort of- You are a, a nomad. A little bit of charisma helps you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> helps make the difference there. But yeah, I was, I was very nomadic and, and I did not have a place of my own. And um, there was a point when, um, I mean, dude, I, was, I, was, I, I knew that, that uh, nothing I was up to and no news that I had to share was- the type of news that was gonna like make my my dad feel really happy about you know like I um had a uh, I just didn't have any any I wasn't doing anything that my dad would have been proud of and I kind of had too much pride to uh, I, I just I just fell off the radar which is just the shittiest thing that a kid can do and. Um, I had too much pride to ask for help. I had too much pride to, uh, you know, explain my situation. I just fell off the radar. And during the six months of uh, just not communicating with uh, with my parents, um, I entered into a medical study to um, for money. You know, um, and as medical studies go, the more uh, dangerous the study, the more they pay. So okay. I went in for the most dangerous shit I could possibly oh. sign up for. Like what? It was um, it was it was a medical study to test on people a drug that that uh, they were hoping to make legal to administer to pigs and cows, so that the pigs and cows would have. Um, more muscle and less fat. It was supposed to work in a, in like an inverse way that steroids might work or, or, um, uh, but the, the purpose being so that they could, um, have slaughter the, the cattle and, and have a leaner meat to appeal to a more health conscious consumer. Interesting. And by the virtue of the fact that this meat would be consumed by, Humans. Uh, by humans, a, a trace amount of this drug being in the meat would enter the human body, and as such, they if okay. anything's going to come in contact with the human body, it needs to be tested. Yes. And it seems that the objective of this study was to determine how much the human body could withstand of this shit, okay. like, which seems counterintuitive. <laughs> but the, 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 the goal of the study, uh, you know, the target that they were aiming to hit was for one of the uh, subjects in the study, someone's resting heart rate had to reach 150 beats a minute. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, that was the- and, and Resting? They, resting heart rate, 150 beats per minute. Who's heart, resting heart rate? <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was, dude. And I remember like the, like the resting, I remember, I remember like, there were only six of us in the study and, and typically medical studies are gonna have like way more than that, yeah. but because it was, you know, considered a particularly dangerous study. They had a smaller number of, wow. of people in it. And I remember like one or two of the guys just being drenched in sweat, you know, like uh, on the day that they, uh, that they, that they gave it to us or there was one day when they were, they, they did a blood draw on the hour, every hour. Wow. Yeah. I think we gave blood like 10 times in a day. I wonder if they're checking sugar levels. Perhaps, I don't know. But they also had us on um, like the sonogram Mm. thing for our heart. 
this this happened in was it Anavar? No, no. The oh. drug was called ractopamine hydrochloride, and uh, oh, you know the name of it. Oh yeah, I mean we knew the name of it at the time. But like you still. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean it's just like. <laughs> I mean, they, it was kind of a notch in my belt at that time. Like, I was like, I'm going to be a crazy, famous stuntman. I'm wild. I'm crazy. And this was like just par for the course. Like, almost as much Did you as document the, it? Like, I, I did. And I did. I would have. Um, but uh, in my, you know, my, in my travels, starting out at the University of Miami, the video camera I had, these those VHS sons of bitches, um, didn't do well in super hot cars, mm. <laughs> you know, like the the rubber that the ribbon yeah. needs to go around, like fucking sure. melted. <laughs> so, oh, that sucks. so my camera was uh, was rendered useless. But um, yeah, this happened. In, I was in that medical study in January of 1994, mm. and um, yeah, like I, I got paid two thousand bucks. Wow, it's good money. It's supposed to be twelve hundred, as I recall, and uh, they didn't. Get um, enough to, volunteers. They, they didn't get enough heartbeats per minute. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they asked us, "Could we extend the study? We're going to give you more money." And then everybody said yes. Wow. But uh, but the, so they were. Um, it was the the sonogram machine, which they'll look at uh, babies in the womb with, you know, like uh, imaging, imaging, and um, but they were but they were they, they lubed it up and they had it on our hearts. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was so fascinating because uh, on the screen, the oxygenated blood, like, you know, uh, leaving or coming or whatever. Yeah, you would see the Doppler like, flow, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and the, like the, this, the sonogram or whatever, the, the sonar would detect the oxygen, the blood, so, such that the blood coming in of the heart is one color on the screen and the blood coming out was another color. It was just fucking- Well, the way that they do it is the, the it move, flow moving towards is one color, flow moving Oh, uh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. I, I, well, one way or another, I was- But it looks like a textbook where it's like, oh, this is the oxygenated blood. Right. This is the deoxygenated, because no blood is actually blue. Right, 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 yeah. right. Um, I, now, that, like, uh, I rem you know, here's the other thing too, is that uh, there was so much free- medical attention that we got oh, in this study. I remember the, the, the doctor who was operating the, the you know, sonogram thing, um, if I'm even using that term the probe. correctly. Yeah, it was an yeah. echocardiogram. Yeah, but, okay. But it's the same. Yeah. Right. The guy who was operating it and you know, moving it around and looking at the image on the screen, when he looked at my heart, he said, man, what a squeeze. And uh, this was the first time I learned that I've got like an exceptionally like powerful heart. And I mean, if you take my my pulse right now, like my normal like normal heart rate, is, you know, normal pulse is is like what seventy two beats a 60 minute. Sixty to a hundred is. I'm like forty to fifty. Oh, is that but, because you're in great shape right now? Like, or that's like it, people. Like uh, jump to the conclusion that I'm in great shape. I'm not really in great shape. Maybe it's because you had this raka da da. <laughs> I mean, who knows? But I, I have a low ass heart rate. You're like, like Captain America. You got the serum. Yeah, I've got a low <laughs> ass heart rate, and wow, uh, and and um, throughout that whole study, the only time my heart rate went over 90 beats per minute was when that same doctor with the echocardiogram was telling me like stories about being in Vietnam and killing people or something. Oh, no. <laughs> it was some weird one. I don't remember what it was, but but it was some crazy like battle story. And wow. he was like telling me some wild stuff. And that was when my heart <laughs> pounded the fastest. That's why you had a good pump there going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh but 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 the 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 uh you know what what it sounded like was that um was that uh, the implication was that what a squeeze meant that I have uh, such a low heart rate in the 40s and, and 50s because it just takes less, my, my, my heart is powerful enough to be able to do all of the circulation it needs to do without beating as many times. Yeah, so the, the heart is a really complicated organ because a lot of what we think is good with regular skeletal muscle is not always good for our cardiac muscle. I'll give you an example. Let's say you have high blood pressure throughout your circulatory system, right? Your heart has to pump against that. 
So it becomes essentially diesel, right? Because it's constantly pumping against a higher pressure. That's actually bad. That uh-huh. your, ha- your left ventricle, which is the lower portion of the left side of your heart that actually pumps blood to the rest of your body, that can become bigger, which is called hypertrophy of that area. And then as a result, it doesn't relax well. And uh, uh, the cardiac muscle in comparison to most of the skeletal muscle in your body needs to contract and relax well, both. It needs to be balanced. Uh Because when the cardiac muscle relaxes is when it fills. So if it doesn't relax well, it doesn't fill well, therefore that when you pump, you can actually have a non-successful pump even though it's super strong. Because it didn't relax enough to fill up. Okay. So isn't that weird, like about the heart? Yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. You know, um, I I once went, uh, I once went to to the doctor for like a standard checkup to to be cleared for some reality TV show, mm-hmm. and uh, they, they, the the reality TV show in question was uh, a, a mountain climbing show. Mm. Uh, in uh, in Peru, where I found my dog from Peru, wow. um, it was basically like mountain climbing with the stars, and it was going to be like more uh, you know physically demanding than your average. So 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 in this case, they had me like on a on a, on a treadmill, like you know they had me like you know, doing all this stuff. But, but it was a more I think comprehensive physical, and the doctor called up, and he said, "You have pre diabetes." Mm. Pre-diabetes, and, and I thought well, that's kind of weird, you know. And he says, "You're not, you're." He said, "Like cause I'm not like an, an obese guy, but he said, you are what we refer to as skinny fat. You've got <laughs> fat on your organs. Okay. This what is that? Yeah, what does that mean? Okay, there's a lot to unpack there okay. <laughs> from the medical <laughs> side of things. I don't consider that great bedside matter. First of all, <laughs> <laughs> I have to be critical. Okay, okay. good. Um, yeah, so, it wasn't. I mean, the guy told me this over the phone. Well, like, yeah. it, is, it also like he's jumping to a conclusion without probably knowing the full picture. Unless, I, I did. Like, turn did around, you do an ultrasound? And I anything? did turn around and go to Doctor Drew mm. to to get more uh, info. Like what? Well, like I went to Doctor Drew's medical practice and you know had an echocardiogram and okay. and he was like, "No, nah, dude, you're fucking fine. This yeah. is bullshit." <laughs> so. This is why I hate looking at lab tests and not really knowing the patient because I'll give you an example. If you don't go f- uh, fasting eight hours like you, you had to do for your surgery yeah. for the blood work, your sugar might come up slightly high, but that's normal because you're not fasting. So right. you're not pre-diabetic. You can't even make a diagnosis of pre-diabetes off of that one blood test. Right. You need multiple, uh, you need to see that it happens like successive blood tests. Uh, there's another blood test that we do called the hemoglobin A1C. This gives me the average range of your sugars for the last three months. So it's usually a better picture of what your sugar is like. And based off that number, we can say, oh, you're in the range of clear. Some people fall into the range of prediabetes and some patients are diabetic. Once you become into the diabetic range, that's for life. You, even if you control it well with diet alone. There was a, 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 a vegan documentary that said that cure it. type two diabetes could be reversible. So it's controllable. The fact that you've developed it puts you in the higher risk category because it's really just definitions. Right, okay. So like we can argue the semantics of whether it's cured or treated. Like in right. reality, like once you hit that threshold, your risk lifelong goes up for heart attack, stroke, those cardiovascular right. diseases. So- Is it true that one in three Americans born after year 2000 will develop diabetes? I don't know offhand, but- doesn't I, sound unreasonable. I, I, I read that statistic and I yeah. found it staggering. Yeah. Well, t- the reason a lot of folks develop type 2 diabetes, not everybody, because some people have genetic issues, other medical conditions right. that can lead to it, um, but it's from overconsumption of calories and poor calories, like right. meaning not good quality ones. And as a result, if you overeat, a few things happen, your sugar gets out of control because your body right. becomes develops insulin resistance, right. where you have insulin, but it doesn't work in your tissues well because there's always so much of it that it becomes ineffective. Um, and then you have uh, people who develop actually fatty liver disease, where because of the high levels of triglycerides in their blood, high levels of cholesterol, their liver actually starts becoming inflamed as a result of the fat buildup inside the liver. 
So maybe that's what the doctor was mentioning because he may have seen some liver right. enzyme elevation. But the way that it was explained to you was kind of <laughs> garbage. I, yeah, I mean, I, I'll never forget the phone call and it was pretty brief and it was basically what it is. I don't think I mischaracterized it. No, I, yeah. I, honestly, that, that's not out of what ordinary of what I hear from other people. Right. So that's disappointing. Do you have bad experiences with doctors? Like, um, are you ever like, screw this yeah, person? I, I don't know that I have doctor trauma, right? You know, <laughs> uh, I, well, then again, there, there was another like a uh, pretty incredibly bad experience. Um, before I got clean and sober and uh, actually specifically in 2006, I was good buddies with Dr. Drew then. Um, I was uh, with him on uh, his radio show, Love Line, like quite frequently, considered him a friend. And I was like just a, a goddamn mess. I was uh, very out of control with drugs and alcohol. And my family was uh, kind of leaning on me like, we're, you know, we're concerned about your lifestyle and, you know, this and that. And, you know, being an active alcoholic and a drug addict, my reaction was I said, hey, guys, I, I, I'm going to go get uh, this checkup, you know, fully. Like it was it was called the UCLA Executive Health Program. And oh, Dr. I'm Drew. I'm not a fan of those. <laughs> okay. But no, go ahead. Dr. Yeah. Drew referred me to it. Okay. Um, it was described to me as such an overwhelmingly comprehensive physical that they're giving you information that's like just extraneous and as such as bullshit. <clears throat> not even covered by it's it's just not covered by any health insurance because it's considered like unnecessary. They're giving you so much extra medical attention. It's expensive and this and that. <clears throat> I heard about that from Dr. Drew <clears throat> and I told my family, hey, I'm going to go into this executive health fucking physical and it's going to be the most comprehensive thing. And, and, and if my results come back uh, saying that I'm healthy, like you guys can just get off my back. That's why those programs are bad because imagine <laughs> it came up healthy and then you live this terrible right. lifestyle. <clears throat> Okay. I, uh, I, I said, if I, if I come up healthy, you can just get right off my back. And so I went into the thing. It was like, a, it was a pretty, pretty full day of, of, uh, testing, you scans, know, this. scans, testing. And, um, I, uh, got a phone call about the results and the doctor said, Hey, um, I want you to come in so we can talk about your results, which is like right off the bat, like super scary because if you're okay, they'll just tell you you're okay on the phone. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh man, what's wrong? And I'm just like, oh, please don't let it be my wiener. Please don't let it be. <laughs> you know, like, like, I just didn't want to hear that I We had don't some... even have tests for wieners. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I just didn't want to, I was just scared there was going to be some weird sexual transmitted disease thing. Oh, and, okay, got it. And, uh, and, I, and I, um, I, you know, I go in there and I'm, I'm like, I don't even think the doctor, I'm in his office and I'm like, it's, it's, it's my wiener okay? And he's like, it's like, hey, your, your wiener's fine. It's your heart. He says, uh, he, he diagnosed me with cardiomyopathy. Mm. He said, I had the heart of a 90-year-old man and that I wouldn't live to be the age of 40 if I didn't do something or other. And and this sounded to me like a crazy yeah. death sentence. You know, Alcohol-induced, probably. Yeah, it was, uh, and I remember... Uh, I went like straight from there to, to love line. It was like with, with Dr. Drew was on the radio. I was like, wow. You know, and it was like the Steve was dying. Episode, you know, and like, ah, uh, and, um, then ultimately I went to a heart specialist and it was like, eh, not so much like borderline, like not, mm. not a big deal. And, and, um, so they overread the echo. They, yeah. I, I mean, perhaps the, like it was just evident, like how heavy my drinking was, and and uh, this was the doctor's attempt to like sort of get through to me, and sure. So maybe I was like uh, over diagnosed somehow, like. Uh, but but in any case, that was a pretty bad experience. Yeah. So you, do you? Let's say the doctor did that. He overread it because he wanted to protect you. Yeah. yeah. Would you? Do you like that or no? Well, I mean the the. Like by definition, an alcoholic, you know, like the, like what the disease of alcoholism means is that you're powerless 
to, you've lost the power to choose, you know, like you got an alcoholic in front of the judge and the judge says, you know, if, uh, if I see you in here again, like it's going to be prison. And then the, the alcoholic walks out and says, man, fuck, I'm going to prison. <laughs> you, know, like, you can't, you can't do anything about it. You tell, you tell the alcoholic that, uh, if they drink again, they're going to die. Like, oh man, fuck, I'm going to die. <laughs> you know, like, uh, it didn't do anything. How would you have wanted them to deliver the news? Um, just fairly, just straight shot. Yeah, I mean, like you, you've got a, uh, you know, uh, a, a borderline case. Like you're teetering. I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe that wouldn't have changed anything, but I damn well didn't change anything no, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, that's why I, I was saying earlier that I'm not a fan of those executive health programs because they're checking a lot of things that don't benefit from being checked because right. a lot of times we can't intervene or shouldn't. Right, so you're saying don't ask a question to which there is no good answer or, or that you might get a bad answer to. Uh, I like asking questions. Uh, don't do tests and imaging that you don't have a plan with. And I'll give you a simple example of this. I had uh, an 80 something year old patient who was bleeding rectally and we were suspecting a tumor in her colon. And we said, you know, we should do a colonoscopy to see if it's that. And her response is, why would I do a colonoscopy if I'm saying that if there is a tumor, I don't even want surgery. And she's right. Why would we check for a tumor if she already knows she doesn't want the surgery? I've got I've got a, another example. Um, my buddy Tony Hawk. Okay. He uh, found out that uh, the this um, CTE condition with mm -hmm. the concussions, mm -hmm. um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Right. He found out that there is um, like a, a gene some uh, genetic disposition for Alzheimer's, which if you have it or if you don't have it, I think if you have it, you are considerably more at risk of CTE. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he explained to me that when he found out this information, he immediately went to go find out if he had uh, this, um, this gene, this Alzheimer's gene, which put him at risk for CTE. And, and, and where I'm coming from, it's like, hey, Tony, bro, like we've, we've already hit our heads, <laughs> you know? Well, that's the thing, like, is it like, actionable? It, yeah. It, it, and I said, it said that, so I said to him, because I was thinking about it a lot, like I've hit my head a lot, like, uh, do I want to know this? I said, I said, hey, Tony, like, and thankfully he said he did not have the gene. Mm -hmm. But but uh, I, I was, I asked him, um, well, what were you going to do? And I asked him like considerably later. It was just on my mind. And, yeah. then, and then I like reached out, reached back out to him like, hey, Tony, like if you had that Alzheimer's gene, like what was your plan? He's like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Curiosity. <laughs> right. So they, they, that's a case of there's nothing actionable yeah. about it. And uh, what are you going to do with the, with the information if you, if you have that gene? Like I don't fucking want to know if I have that gene. Yeah, that's why like a lot of these also – send out home tests that check for certain genetic conditions I'm not a fan of because a lot of times they're not checking for all the variants of a certain genetic um, situation. And as a result, people start making life planning decisions about it. Right. So I'm like, please see a genetic counselor, like speak to an expert on this. Don't just take a test and say, oh, I'm either all good or all bad because you need some guidance as to how to read these results. That's why doctors are around. We're there to help. Right. Okay. How about this? I remember, I believe I was in high school. I believe I was in high school, um, 1991, you know, like, like the, the it, I, was, I was sexually active. And like everything I'd learned in school about HIV and AIDS was just top tier terror. Mm -hmm. And because I had had unprotected sex, like, a couple times, I went to the family doctor and I was like, yo, like, doctor, I want, like, please test me for uh, HIV AIDS. You know, I'm so, I'm so scared. Like, I was just like freaking out about it. And the doctor said, nope, we're not going to do that. Like, uh, it, and it, he was kind of like his position he was coming from was that like, I was like a young guy, like, yeah, and I'm I'm not surprised that you hate this, this idea, but he was like, just we're, we're not going to ask that question because, you know, like. He, the the doctor, because, because like, uh, I, I don't know. I've been, 
That's weird. It's super weird. And, and, and no answer given as to why? It was just like, uh, we you're, don't, we what, don't what need to know that. Young, what what yeah. do you mean we don't? <laughs> yeah, it's maybe like, oh, then, no, you're, you're not going to like, I mean, maybe there was like, uh, you don't fall into a high risk category, like, you know, based yeah. on uh, gender, sexual orientation. Maybe like, I was two uh, years old then, so I don't know what medical things existed then, but now certainly we wouldn't do it. Right. I mean, that's fucking fucked up as hell. Yeah. To think that like, uh, oh, I'm going to, you know. But then again, I've ha I had a lot of buddies that said there's no way to, you know, as long as you don't get tested, you def you're definitely clean. <laughs> <laughs> Comfortably, I'll give the medical advice that that is wrong. Right. For sure. For sure. And, uh, you know, I'm just glad that uh, for, for all of my years, you know, navigating the minefield that I, I came through unscathed. You Does know? your health insurance company hate you because you meet the deductible probably like this? Um, right? Because you probably cost them an arm and a leg each year. I wonder. Um, I, I, like especially filming Jackass and Wild Boys. Yeah. And, the, 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 that's workman's comp. So, oh, so that's true. Uh, so that's when, a different level of insurance. When, when I'm on, uh, when I, when I'm injured on a jackass movie, I don't even have to produce a medical insurance card, and and that's uh, um, workman's comp. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's been, um, especially because in the in the more recent years of of my career. Like, like all of my worst injuries have happened in now the the last six years. Really? Yeah. Is it age related? I, I th like I think perhaps age is a component, but it's just more of a question of trying to raise the bar all the time. You know, That's like the, the, like you got to jump higher. You know, like so, like yes, I'm getting older, and like uh, I. I have felt compelled to take greater risks, yeah. you know, so it's scary. Oh, well, so speaking of taking greater risks, you're, for your next comedy tour, you're going to do the Gone Too Far. Yeah, that's my plan, yeah. And you're going to show people stunts that you think that they will say you've gone too far. Correct. As a medical professional, do you want to tell me some of them and I'll tell you if you've gone too far? Well, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, <laughs> there, there's, there, I've been very candid about my plan for uh, breast augmentation surgery. Okay, what is that going to entail? It's just, uh, yeah, I'm going to get double D boobs. Okay. And, um, and do what with them? Well, there's a, a, a few, I don't need to give away all my ideas, but the okay. first thing that uh, I intend to do um, is it like a, a a statement, like a political statement, or just as a prank? Wait, they're, they're like as, as far as a statement goes, I think there's a a, he, a healthy dose of my body, my choice mm. in there. Okay, you know which I believe in. Um, there's some just straight curiosity that mm. uh, as a heterosexual man who identifies as male. Um, does just going and get a, get a boob job all of a sudden mean I can't post pictures on Instagram with my shirt off? Ah, like that's okay. a question that needs to be answered. Okay. You know? So it, it's much <laughs> in like when you went to your lawyer and asked for jail time. <laughs> <laughs> sort of. Yeah, sort of. It's, You're uh, going to go to prove a point here. <laughs> right. And, um, you know, there, there, there's just like a lot, I think a lot of uh, opportunities to, um, to, 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 mine it for compelling content and 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 jokes um the motivation for it is uh you know i pictured that whole show the gone too far show ultimately thematically to be an exploration of my experience confronting middle age mm. um you know the the deterioration of my my body and and um in particular with the boobs uh, I'm. I was horrified to see in the mirror that I am officially developing man titties, mm. and uh, have di already distinct under boob. I've got, I've got dimples okay. underneath my man boobs, okay. and uh, lashing out at the god that allowed that to happen. I've, I'm <laughs> gonna make uh, big old titties. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you why. You'll have back pain. Uh, I'll predict that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so your low back's not going to be happy with that. Going to want to stretch even a more, more important strengthen. stretch. Yeah, yeah. Strengthen, strengthen. Um, But I'm not planning on keeping these boobs for more than three months. So it's going to be kind of uh, like I'm surgically. On, that's going to be tough. Uh, I, I'm, I'm under. I, I've been. Uh, I've been told that 
after three months, there's more stretching, uh, and it's going to be uh, more difficult to to restore me to mm. to normal. Interesting. I wouldn't even know how to comment on that. How, how did you find a doctor though? Uh, I, I had uh, as a guest on my podcast uh, of botched fame, oh, okay. Dr. Terry Dubrow. Got it. And uh, he said that he would not put in the implants, but they'd be happy to take them out and do whatever uh, yeah, little little yeah. bits that, that need to be done to restore me to, to, to normal. And uh, perhaps the, the you know where I end up will resolve the man titty problem. <laughs> you know, who knows? I can only hope. My worry is, as a doctor, is going to be that you can develop other problems surgically, but I hope that's not the case. Right. So I'm not yeah. wishing that upon you by there, any means. Yeah, for, for sure. Um, now, there's, of course, different types of breast implants. Like uh, under the muscle is a more involved situation mm -hmm. where you can have... Uh, what, what's that uh, condition? It's capsular contracture. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's, wow, you looked into it, like yeah, the risks. Yeah, um, but but if, if you're not under the muscle, then the capsular contracture is less of a concern, right? And like, uh, so just the the like over the over the top, like kind of is more of a of a super superficial job. I'm gonna venture a guess that you're gonna get them put in outside of the U.S. Oh, I don't know. Oh. That that, just, that 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 sounds like a great time. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know if they would do it in the U.S. I don't know. I think oh, uh, Dr. Terry DeBro said that they'll be lining up around the board. Really? So, okay. Yeah, okay. Like, so uh, maybe I take it back. You know that that uh, yeah, that this this is gonna be not a problem to find somebody to put them in. Um, now, like of the like to what like, kind of the the over the top thing um, that that approach to it, it feels somewhat less invasive, a little bit more of a superficial procedure mm -hmm. and allows more easily for, uh, um, like if, if, if I've got like a colored liquid, is it just saline in that situation or is it silicone? It depends. I don't know. I'm not a plastic surgeon. Cause we so. could, we could, uh, perhaps, you know, if it's like saline or something, it could be like, uh, dyed a certain color and, you know, like I have just this crazy vision of a like a, a metal Capri Sun straw. Which <laughs> well, no, I don't think <laughs> if, if they were easily that penetratable, that would be a problem. Uh, okay. Yes, I, I hope that's not. We how. were also talking about just like a, like an endurance thing. Like, what what can it, what what will it take to to break it? Mm. You know, like that. That's a, I've seen idea. videos of that. Do you think? Yeah, that, like they, Dr. Terry Dubrow said that they uh, had a silicone implant, you know, and like drove a car over it and everything. Wow. Okay. There. So yeah, they are terrible. Yeah. Um, do you think that you'll get uh, pushed back by folks, uh, maybe of the trans community, I, making I, light of the situation or no? I don't. I don't. That that was my fiance's concern about that, and um, what I told her. I said I just don't like I like I'm not coming into this with any uh any like mean spirit the, the the spirit of what I'm doing it for is not hateful or negative at all. Mm -hmm. And and I likened it to the like the homoerotic humor that's been such a part of Jackass and and my other show Wild Boys. Mm -hmm. We were never um trying to put down or mock the homosexual community. If anything, we were like proactively seeking to make people uncomfortable who were like the kind of jock dude, like, oh man, no, you know, like that would be our target. Hmm. And in this case, like I'm not out to, to mock or, or uh, target anybody of the trans community. If anything, it would be much the same. Like I, I, I love the idea of somebody who's particularly transphobic being made uncomfortable by me doing mm. this. Yeah. So that I mean that that's all I know. I, I can only speak for your intent. For my intent, for the you know I, I'm I, I think there's a larger message of my body, my choice, which is something that uh, that I, I love to. But but yeah, it's just. I'm not doing it to make anybody feel bad. Sure. You know, that's never what I, like, that's one thing I never want to do is make people feel bad. Yeah. I think 
that shines through. And you know when it shines through the most? I um, I was at Harvard yesterday uh, on a panel speaking on health policy and there was an infectious disease doctor. And I mentioned that you're coming on my podcast today and he goes, oh my God, I was just showing jackass to my eight and 11 year old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, I don't know if that's for them. But yeah. like, he was ecstatic. And yeah. you know, you would think doctors, very highbrow, Abdullah, right? For sure. right? Would, yeah. would be maybe saying, oh, I'm not gonna show that to my children yet, but look. I mean, I um, ha have maintained for the longest time that I'm proud, I'm very proud of Jackass for how wholesome it is. And I know it's counterintuitive to, to describe Jackass as wholesome but I feel strongly that it is because there's just nothing mean spirited about it. You know, mm -hmm. you see a bunch of guys giving themselves and each other, you know, a terrible hard time. You know, you could liken it to torture, just, you know, self-destructive, uh, you know, self-harm, but we're such attention whores. We're begging for the attention. We're such willing participants. We're so happy to be doing it that that makes it permissible how destructive some of our behavior is. And beyond what we're doing to ourselves and each other, there's just nothing mean-spirited about it. Like we're just doing it to make people laugh and, and uh, spread joy. Yeah, I think you hit it right on the nose there. It never felt that there was a bullying aspect to Jackass. On this, this most recent movie, like I felt that the cup test went, <laughs> went a little bit far. Like that, like okay. that might have edged into the the, <laughs> the that, bullying aspect. Yeah, that was, uh, and maybe it's just because I was there for all of it. But um, but yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. It, the, the the spirit of Jackass is just super positive, and um, and I'm proud of that. You know, that's awesome that you guys have that camaraderie. Are you still close with everybody for in sure. the gang? Yeah, yeah. That's that's the big difference. There's a lot of uh, like YouTube channels right now that are struggling because there's groups of people who do well on YouTube. They blow up together, and then someone in the group says like, "I've been really bullied in this group for the views." And not uh, at my expense. Right, okay. Versus you guys never had that. Like it seems like you guys are all very together. Right. You, you really feel like a family. It comes through. Yeah. The, the when you say that, I can think of a of a distinct example of that. And uh, yeah, we're not. We're all pretty willing participants. Our buddy Danger Aaron, who was the subject of the cup test, has definitely been. Uh, you know, I, I would even characterize as bullied. But I'm proud to say that I've really never bullied him. Okay. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about your comedy, your okay. stand-up comedy, because cool. you said you've gotten flack for uh, being a comedian and a superstar, but you yeah, put in the I, hours. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily go as far as to say superstar, but uh, but yeah, whenever somebody comes um, from one area of the world of entertainment into stand up they get you know some side eye action you know a little like, gatekeeping. Uh, yeah a little gatekeeping and um it's not uh it's not been like a a particularly pervasive thing but uh but certainly there have been examples of people who are uh even outspokenly opposed to the idea of welcoming steve-o into the world of stand up comedy and uh I, you know, I, I'm not going to say that that didn't bother me, but I'm very happy to say that that did not stop me. Mm. Did it encourage you? Um, I, I would say to an extent it encouraged me, for sure. Um, but like, I, I'm just a guy who's all in no matter what I do. I, I do not know moderation, and um, you know, like I, I don't know how to not just give something everything and. and um, I think that as it related to my experience doing stand-up comedy, like uh, this is kind of the results speak for themselves because if you're, if you don't belong there, if you don't belong in the comedy club, if you're not taking it seriously, if you're not um, you know, delivering uh, a, a show that, that people are, are enjoying, then you're not gonna come back. 
you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be short-lived. And um, in the comedy club circuit, I, for 11 straight years, kept making the, the loop and coming back, and, and that uh, indicates that, that I did belong. <laughs> you know, yeah. and so the proof is there, and, and, and I've since graduated from the comedy club circuit to performing in theaters and traveling on a tour bus, and, dude, I love it. Yeah, that's awesome. You become, is it fair to say that you're become a crossover comedian or do you not like that term? I, I don't mind. I, I don't mind one bit if uh, someone wants to call me a crossover com comedian. Um, I, I would just say that I'm an entertainer. You okay. know, I'm an attention whore uh, through and through. And um, I spent 11 years in comedy clubs developing the craft of storytelling and joke telling. And, um, over the course of that time, I, I found that my, my world converged. Mm -hmm. And, and um, now what I'm doing with my comedy is, uh, is a multimedia affair. So, so you've got like me telling stories, and then at the end of the story, I pay it off by actually showing a video of that story happening. So you've hybridized your, your entertainment. Yeah, it's, it's good. I've really stumbled upon something like truly unique and original. And, uh, you know, the stunts that, that I did for my current tour, which is called the Bucket List Tour, across the board, like, just, I mean, you'd be fascinated by uh, the fact that um, two of the, the bits in, in my Bucket List Tour, two items on the list, which each have their own respective videos, one of them involved a medical professional in disguise administering stolen general anesthesia drugs <laughs> while I was riding a bicycle. And uh, the, the drug um, was, was called Etomidate. Okay. Because when we were doing our research and speaking with uh, anesthesiologists, they described um, an epidemic among just about everybody who has access to propofol rampantly abusing it like Michael Jackson did. Mm. They said, but there's another general anesthesia drug called Etomidate, which they affectionately refer to as Vomidate because it makes you so nauseous you might barf. It would be like a overall physically uncomfortable. And they said, dude. It's like a deterrent, basically. They said nobody would ever use Etomidate for fun. Okay. And I was like, green light, go. So you're keeping always that in the back of your head. Like, I got to Oh, yeah, it. for sure. I got to protect my sobriety. The, the bit started out as um, a, 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 a foot race, which would start on your mark, get set, and they shoot tranquilizer darts into our butt cheeks, at which point we sprint for distance. But finding out that that involved ketamine was, mm. was uh, um, you know, that shut that down right away. And then another one I did for the bucket list. And it's so great that you get to see these videos, like, actually in the of theater course, on the yeah. tour. Um, because I was so concerned, and after the Atomidate one, I, I, I was like, man, they said nobody would use it for fun, but I thought it felt great. And I was, like, really, like, questioning my sobriety after doing that stunt. Mm. Um, and I felt that that was just a, a, a catastrophic failure. And, and um, a guy who introduced himself to me as a doctor said, I've got a way you can finish your anesthesia bit without worrying about your recovery. I can, he says, I can put a four inch needle into your spine, inject a drug into your spinal cavity that will straight paralyze you from the waist down. And we can make that happen while you're in a full sprint. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds dangerous. Oh, dude, complete like the medical needle. <laughs> the medical. Well, no, I mean he took out the four inch needle, and oh. then I then I went sprinting. Got it. Still yeah, scary. I had like you know ten seconds like uh, to run my ass off before I collapsed like a baby giraffe being born, and um, that fucking shit was so awesome. <laughs> that shit was so awesome. Uh, so that's that that's an, another one of the. So this is sort of like you know coming up with the most. And just outrageously over the top ideas for for stunts, filming them, making an act out of it that incorporates stand up and you know uh, the the footage, 
Like that's something that nobody else is doing. And, you know, anybody doesn't like me doing that, they can suck a fart out of my asshole. (laughs) (laughs) No, like I relate very strongly to you in this sense, because uh, something you probably don't know is I've become a professional boxer over this last year. Oh, wow. And um, a lot of people say, oh, you're a crossover YouTube star now becoming a boxer like all these other people. And, you know, it takes a lot of guts to get in the ring, to be sparring with other fighters. My next fight actually in four weeks is against a UFC MMA fighter. Uh, Who's that? Chris Avila. He's of Nate Diaz's camp. Okay. And um, that's going to be a serious fight for me, but a lot of people will like Showtime, it's on Showtime pay-per-view and Showtime posted our our poster and all the comments are brutal. (laughs) I I don't, I, I, so. I mean, I, 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 uh, can't even speak to that because I'm still jammed up over the fact that a doctor is pursuing <laughs> boxing. That's like the most counterintuitive. That, that, that I file that under oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've lived my whole life also as an oxymoron. Right. But. I mean, uh, just to... Uh, Do you think it's dangerous? Is that why? I mean, I... I I'm, no, I'm not debating if it is. <laughs> no, yeah, it my, is. My, yeah. Con- my concern is the, the repeated... I mean, I think that we've learned, like factually, that boxing is way more fucking dangerous than MMA. Mm. And uh, the um, the reason why the why I believe, I mean, we've just seen it. Like, like nobody dies in MMA. It just doesn't happen. People die in boxing all the time. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and it's like it's brain trauma. And I think that. Uh, I, I, I uh, have an analogy, which I think is accurate, mm-hmm. which is that in today's world, <clears throat> CTE is a big thing with helmets or with football. They're wearing helmets, crashing their heads all the time. And <clears throat> I suspect that back in the day of the leather football helmet, that CTE was not an issue because all they had was a piece of fucking leather on their head. And as such, they didn't like uh, bang their heads together so much. Yeah. But now because the helmet, the, the, the modern American football helmet is, uh, it, it, it's like, it allows you to feel like you're hitting your head with impunity. Mm-hmm. So it's just all crash, crash, crash yeah. with the head. And that's what the problem is. And then now we take a, uh, take that dynamic to boxing and um, the, uh, the, the boxing gloves. glove, the 10-ounce boxing glove, every bit like the football helmet, it allows you to throw your fists with impunity. Mm-hmm. And the weight of it and the, the, the impunity for your hand, it's like you, know, you, you almost feel like you can get hit with it with impunity, but, but you can't. It's too heavy and it's uh, – yeah. whereas with the, the four-ounce glove mm-hmm. – you know, it's, uh, or, or heaven forbid, bare knuckle. Yeah. You know, you're going to be a lot more conservative with your bare knuckles than, um, and even with the four ounce glove, much like with the leather helmet in football. It's true. It, repeated trauma in boxing, like the repetitiveness of getting sure. hit in the head is the issue. That's why I don't plan to do this for a long time. <laughs> like maybe I got another year left in me, so I'm not doing this for a lifelong thing. It's my final hurrah in my early thirties to say, I tried to be a pro athlete. Super cool. Um, and, and, and I like, uh, you know, I've, I've been knocked out completely unconscious, like, um, a handful of times in my life. But what, what scares me more than anything was, uh, you know, early in my career, when I started touring, I had this live stage show. Every time I came out on stage with like a, a 12 pack or, or a 24 pack of Budweiser's and my entrance onto the stage was always, Bump, bump, hitting the, my head with the beer can yeah. until it exploded. And then I would take two and hit them both and explode them. Mm-hmm. And then, dude, embarrassingly, after I got sober and in comedy clubs, I'd come out and do it with carbonated water, like banging my head. And, uh, it, it, you know, there were, it got to a point where, um, you know, like I felt dizzy getting out of bed in the wow. morning, you know, like yeah. uh, not good. And, and just like so much repeat. It's, it's precisely what you said, that repeated... Yeah. Not not the biggest hit, but the repeat that it was so repetitive that like a uh, stupid act of breaking cans on my head is, is uh, what I point to as by far my biggest concern mm-hmm. for my own brain and and CTE situation. If yeah. it, you know, 
They, you know, I heard someone say in, in similar vein of what you're saying, that the best safety feature to put on a car would probably be to put a spike on the steering wheel. Ooh. So that <clears throat> you're like, oh, I got to drive care. I like that. Yeah. I, I've never heard that. I like that. Right? Instead of an airbag, you put <laughs> yeah. not a safety feature like that. You put a threatening feature on yeah. it. Yeah. Because then you're, you're going to be really careful when you drive. Yeah. You ever have guests uh, say that they feel like they've been in a conversation with Bradley Cooper? No. <laughs> no, <laughs> but got I, this, wow, he's got, okay. He's got this, I this, appreciate this, that. this strong resemblance to Bradley Cooper. Wow. Okay. I've never got Very that. handsome guy. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. I like that spike on the steering wheel. That, that's killer. Yeah. That's not mine. I can't take credit. Yeah, for yeah, yeah. But, um, who, um, if you were going to do Sexiest Jackass Alive? I mean, cast not member. Knoxville is uh, always going to be that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We wouldn't have uh, gotten where we were without like him being the the face of it. Got it. Okay. Yeah, it'd be tough to to go second after that. You know. Okay. Lots of competition. You guys would fight for it. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you get re you get into a real fruit basket of apples and oranges. <laughs> you know, like. It's gonna be uh, so largely subjective and and uh, you know up to someone's taste. Before I get to my little quick lightning round of questions, okay. I gotta ask: You've accomplished so much. You've inspired so many people. Even uh, from your Joe Rogan first episode, the amount of people that reached out to you, thanking you for how honest you've been with your journey. Are you proud of all of this? Like this is amazing. Well, for sure. Um, for starters, thank you for, for the kind words. Um, I, I remember my first uh, Joe Rogan, my first real Joe Rogan um, episode was heavily focused on on uh, recovery, and and there was, I mean, just the, the 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 staggering number of people who that reached is. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's intense, you know, the, the audience there. And, and I did get a great amount of feedback from that. Um, for that, uh, for that and anything related to recovery, I think you got to be careful about um, using the word proud. You know, it, it says in our, in our uh, recovery literature that um, there's a reason why pride leads the procession of the seven deadly sins, um, you know, and that uh, you want to be careful about being proud of things and, and to try to focus more on being grateful for things. Mm. You know, we're not like, a, it doesn't serve us to be proud of our recovery. It's much more um, helpful to be grateful for it. Mm. And so if I've been able to inspire people or help people, that's something that I'm, that I'm grateful for. But, um, you know, you got to even be careful about it. You get a little bit of ego, you know, the, 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 your ego being involved in like, yeah, I help people, you know, and I help people. Like, you got to be good. But you deserve it. Like, we, we, if it wasn't deserved, I would yeah. say, yeah, I agree. Yeah, uh, the thing about, about recovery um, is that, that we keep what we have by giving it away. Mm. You know, like uh, if 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 we're if we try to help other people, uh, you know, achieve long term sobriety, then that's the the number one thing we can do to to preserve and protect our own sobriety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I wasn't just talking sobriety. Absolutely. Oh yeah, I mean, I've been about, from I've your been, career wise, I've been super super like to it. It confounds me at like um, the, uh, the you know. The, a career in entertainment is inherently precarious from the onset, you know, mm -hmm. let alone when your, uh, your art is, is what the fuck I do, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and then to have longevity in entertainment is very elusive. So, uh, you know, to be, you know, more than two decades into a career the way that I am. Yeah. I mean, I, it would be an absolute lie to say I'm not proud of that, but I'm just overwhelmingly grateful. For yeah, uh, you've, you've done amazing work. And uh, I look at all the stuff that you've done and it actually drives me to say, look, I got to work hard. I got to continue working and learning from individuals well, like you. So it's so funny I, I thank that, you for that, that. that. When, when you described the, the, the boxing, you said you, you spoke of yourself as a YouTuber and uh, 
I found that a little bit odd considering that you're, uh, you know, a practicing physician. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. You have a medical practice and, you know. Well, that's whatever, that's the bucket I fall into in the inter entertainment space. Like, yes, I'm Dr. Mike, but sure. when I'm in the boxing ring, it's, he's a YouTuber. Okay. Yeah. So that just, ha I think it's because, I don't know if you're familiar with like the Jake Paul and Logan Paul. Of, of course. The world. They've paved their way into that YouTube boxing space and. Sure. That's why I'm sort of put into that bucket. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, it really um, has put a spotlight on the financial compensation of combat sports. We'll yes. say that. Yep. And uh, it, it's um, very interesting how uh, it, it's all playing out. And I just love combat sports, man, particularly yeah. uh, MMA. Awesome. I love it. Well, yeah, if you want to come to the fight, it's Where? actually, I'm fighting on Jake Paul's event. Oh, cool. On his undercard. So, so on the Anderson Silva Silver, thing, it's yes. October 29th still? Correct, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll be in Canada, but um, I appreciate the invite. Yeah, yeah, that would have been epic. Yeah. All right, so let me give you the lightning round here. Okay. That makes me very interested in watching that. Really? Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I hope I don't let you down. <laughs> I trained this morning really hard. I'm running tonight as well. So cool. the training doesn't stop. Okay. Lightning round. First question. What's a weird thing your body does that not everybody else's body does? Uh, double jointed. Oh, okay. And uh, how's this one not going? Oh, it's uh, become double, arthritic. I was going to say it's, double jointed or arthritic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know what's hilarious? Uh, yeah, I can do that. Okay. I can. Uh, you have good control I can, I can of the. Bend. I think that counts as double jointed too. <laughs> okay. You know it's funny. Uh, my first guest was Cal Penn on this podcast from Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. Okay. And he did the same exact thing. So it's interesting okay, cool. that my first two guests said the same. Um, wow, what's... I'm your second guest. Yeah. Wow, how about that? Yeah. Cool. Um, actually, the podcast launched today. It was, Epic. Today, yeah, it was awesome. It's doing really well. So this will continue the streak. Nice. Um, What's one stunt you would do if we could guarantee you wouldn't suffer any medical consequences? So you feel the pain, but I as a doctor have the... Ooh. Um, God, there's a lot. <laughs> I mean, the first stop Niagara Falls. <laughs> oh, in a barrel. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I, I was obsessed with that idea for some time, and uh, my... my Jackass comrade, Chris Pontius, got me off of it and saying one thing. He said, dude, it's been done. <laughs> it's been done. I was like, ah, oh, yeah, you're right. Um, but yeah, there's, uh, like, I've got a lot of, you know, a fair amount of anxiety and and uh, just pure will to um, to, to do something that, that I call the, the crash capsule, mm. where uh, it, it's just effectively... Um, like kind of a survival pod that I'm in, if not a, uh, like just a roll cage with a five point harness that, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, like a seat lives in and it just goes like rolling down the mega ramp and off the lunch and, you know, over a waterfall, like uh, hit by a car, like, you know. <laughs> like, like a Simpsons like, episode. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, when it comes to like high impact, throwing your body around, you know, like, falling great heights and you know that's it's fucking scary man yeah so yeah that i would okay. i would go to town on the crash capsule all right i'm gonna make it happen with my miracle invention <laughs> at some point uh what's one silly thing you wish you could change about your body i guess that you're gonna get implants right that's um that's a silly thing and it's gonna change <laughs> okay so we answered that one um what's one food you don't like you wish you did and one food uh you do that you wish you did it um a food I don't like, I don't know that I wish I did like it, but I just can't do raw onions. Uh, they oh. brought raw onions bum me out. Okay. Probably I mean, also not great for the Barretts. Okay, there you go. So I'm glad I don't like them. <laughs> Is there any food you like that you wish you didn't? I mean. Guilty pleasure? I, I Like, does anybody, like, uh, not wish they didn't like candy? <laughs> Which candy? What's your go-to? I mean, just sugar. Like, I have, like, terrible trouble with sugar. Oh, like, okay. uh, you know, I'm... I, I, I'm in and out of a food program. Mm. I've actually, uh, since June 4th, I've been uh, good about no obnoxious sugar. Okay. Okay, so sugar. Uh, which stunt do you think brought you closest to death, not pain? Um, 
I, I think uh, I was in in legitimate danger of uh, the bends on mm. a on a, a scuba diving thing. Um, just kind of ignorant, and uh, our underwater cameraman like grabbed my fin. Ooh. And by the time uh, when we got up to the top, he was super exasperated. He was just, just, just very angry. He said, "He said you fucking almost died, and I almost died trying to save you." Wow! Like I had just been, you know, kind of blissfully ignorantly mm. just. And I was like, "Dude, they told me the sharks were on the bottom." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, the, the bends is serious if it happens. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, I understand that that was uh, like genuinely. Yeah, I, I think it's it's a, a anticlimactic answer, but um, no, it's I think true. But your blood literally begins to bubble, so like yeah. that's a problem. Um, last but not least, what's your favorite stunt you've never been allowed to do? My favorite stunt that I've never been allowed. So, I like my my ultimate like wish. List. Uh, Do you have to clear it with the insurance company of like the shoot? Oh, I mean, no, I, I, I uh, have been pretty, pretty reckless in that. Okay. Um, and 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 whenever whenever uh, like MTV would would say no, like we won't give you permission to do that, I would typically just turn around and do it on my own. Okay. And uh, you know, like in the early days of my career, I had a. Um, uh, like a too hot for TV DVD series okay. where I just found a home for all the footage that they wouldn't show and went out of my way to shoot footage that they wouldn't show, and I put it out on my own. And then now with uh, with my like my bucket list tour, mm -hmm. and then again with the Gone Too oh. Far, like oh I can't do it for Jackass. Okay, cool, you do it yourself. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's 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 almost like the And One Street Ball. Like, do you remember that when that came about? No, but there's a, there's a, a Netflix. I just show. watched it. Yeah. It's good. Yeah, it's really good. Well worth watching. Okay, good. Then uh, I'll, I'll, I will add that to my queue for sure. Cool. All right, dude. Thank you so much for yeah, coming. Yeah, You're for a sure. rock star. Thank you. I appreciate you and uh, continued success on Gone Too Far. Yeah, on all your ventures. And uh, everybody, grab my book. Yes. Available everywhere books are sold. And podcast. We need. All the, the subscribers to come. Wow, Steve-O was an absolute blast of a guest. I had a great time talking to him, but now I get to answer your medical questions. Remember that if you do leave a five-star review, which is incredibly important to help this podcast, you can, in the body of your review, ask me a medical question, and I'm gonna try and get to some of them right now. Um, so let's start with the first one here. CC Gomez asked, I've been boxing for the last two years and noticed my wrist stability seems to be getting weaker. Any explanation as to why and what preventive measures I can take to avoid injury? Is this a common phenomena for repetitive movement sports? CC Gomez, when you have a ballistic activity like boxing going on, where you're making contact in unpredictable ways, because when you're punching a human body, where there's elbows, there's ribs, you're never gonna get a clean punch. You're always gonna land at a somewhat different angle. And when that happens, you have a higher rate of injury, especially the wrist, which tends to be one of the weaker joints. Now, exercises for this really focus on wrist strengthening, arm strengthening, like elbow work, but in reality, if you're noticing continued weakness, a few things need to happen. One, you probably need to take a break from boxing to figure out what's going on or to see if it just improves on its own. And then B, go see a doctor, have them perform a few special tests, see where the problem is coming from. The last thing I want you to continue doing is boxing if you have something like a fracture going on or a torn ligament. Next. We have Samantha Blocker. I used to work in the OR and love everything about the human body in medicine. I'm currently a home mom raising my two babies. Really cute. Uh, I wanted to stay up to date on the latest. Where would you suggest I find quality and accurate articles or resources of the latest research being done or new procedures happening or newest medical guidance? Okay, there's a lot of questions there, Samantha, and all really good questions, actually. I really like using the general organizations like the WHO, CDC, for the majority of my guidance, the National Institute of Health. But there is a great uh, organization, I'm actually gonna look it up right now. Um, okay, it's called familydoctor.org. 
Uh, there's a lot of information about diseases and conditions, prevention and wellness, family health, and resources for you. There's even a symptom checker, which I'm not a huge fan of, but it, it's a great website, so visit familydoctor.org, again, run by the American Academy of Family Physicians. Flower, one, two, girl, three, four. Why are some kids prone to chronic ear infections? I had this issue as a kid and had to get tubes put in my ear. My husband, Joe, and I love you. Shout out to you, flower girl, one, two, girl, sorry, flower, one, two, girl, three, four, and Joe, appreciate your support. Chronic ear infections happen because of the shape of ear canals, um, the size of ear canals, um, immune system health, and also immunizations. Uh, children who are not fully uh, immunized have higher rates of infections because they're more susceptible to certain types of bacteria. So it's hard to answer why specifically your kids seem to be more prone, but this is a great question to bring up at your pediatric visit or family medicine doctor visit because doctors love asking, answering questions when they know exactly what's going on. They can in individualize the advice directly to you. Mia Ashley asks, what are the benefits of cupping therapy? Now, I've actually had cupping therapy done to me. Um, I don't think it's a miracle cure. I think a lot of things that it's being used for right now is not evidence-based. People say it pulls toxins out, all these sort of miraculous things that don't really mean anything. Where I like it for is to bring circulation to an injured area, perhaps loosen up some myofascial restrictions, because remember, your body has one large fascia that connects your entire body. This is that layer, that thin layer that uh, sits below your skin and really prevents your body from falling apart and your organs from falling out. So as a result, restrictions there can cause pain and discomfort. Um, I have seen cupping therapy work sometimes for that, but again, ignore the miracle cures. Um, Dr. Von Bush. Is it healthy for a teen, 14 to 18, I'm assuming that's the age, to have abs? Is it healthy? I wouldn't say it's unhealthy. I don't think it's mandatory. Um, I think as long as uh, you're at a healthy weight, uh, you're eating healthy, you're sleeping well, that's more important than actually looking at whether or not someone has abs. If you enjoy working out, um, keeping a low body fat, I think it's great. I don't think it's problematic. Um, Tristan Batts, how would you advise a patient with low vitamin D levels? Well, um, it would depend on a few factors. Is my patient having symptoms? How low is their vitamin D level? What led me to check it? Um, and are they already supplementing with vitamin D? Because if a patient has a true vitamin D deficiency where their vitamin D level is like 10, absolutely I would recommend supplementing. But there are certain foods like fatty fish, eggs, uh, some dairy products that do contain vitamin D, and uh, I would probably strive to increase those as well. Nikki V, does organic food matter when cooking non-GMO? Non-GMO, I'm not a huge fan of. I don't think that really means anything because GMOs have not been proven to be harmful to your health by any means. Um, in fact, they've been proven to be quite safe. Uh, and does organic food matter? Um, I think in certain fruits and vegetables where they, you know that they use really harmful pesticides, it might be helpful, but it's not the end of the world if things aren't organic. Like I don't only buy organic produce. I, I'll get it if it's available, but it's not always the best. All right, well, that brings us to the end of today's questions. Please leave us a five-star review. Uh, on Apple Podcasts, can't do it on Spotify, but you can give us just five stars. I appreciate you, and as always, again, stay happy and healthy.